Yeah, sir, we are live now. We can begin. Yeah. Good evening, doctors from India and abroad. Myself, Shubhojit Mukherjee, SBO Head Sales and Marketing, Harmonika Acumetis, welcome you all. I have the great pleasure in introducing none other than Dr. Jaydeep Malhotra. Dr. Jaydeep Malhotra is MD, FICOG, FICS, FMAS, FIUMB, FRCPI, FRCOG. Dr. Jaydeep is President, ART Rainbow IVF. She is the President of Indian Society of Perinatal Diagnosis and Therapy, President, South Asian Federation of Menopause Societies, Immediate Past President, Indian Society of Assisted Reproduction. She is the past president, Foxy, Aspire, and IMS. Regional Director, South Asia, Ian Donan School of USG. Professor Dubrovnik International University, Croatia. Editor-in-Chief of Safog and Safom's journals and many books. She is the past vice chairman, ICOG. She is the member of FICO Committee of Reproductive Endocrinology and Infertility and FIGO Working Group on RDEH. Dr. Jaydeep is the recipient of honorary FRCOG and FRCPI. She is the recipient of Nepal Samman, recipient of Woman of the Year, Ethicon Fellowship. She is the recipient of Indumati Javeri Prize, Dr. MD Hansotia Award, Best Committee Korean Award, Recipient of Jagdishwari Mishra Award three times in a row. She is the Forbes Most Successful Woman and winner of Prime Minister Atmanirbhar App Challenge. Dr. Jaydeep is the initiator of Club 35 Plus, Adbhut Matrutva, and IMOS App. Dr. Jaydeep is credited with first 500 IVF babies of Nepal, first IVF. ICSI, TESA Twins of UP. Dr. Jaydeep is advisor to Maulana Azad Medical College, JNMC Aligarh, and SMS Medical College, Jaipur. Over to Dr. Jaydeep. Thank you, Shubhaji. And a very good evening and a good morning uh, to each and every one of you who is right now logged on to us. Welcome to this first masterclass on endometriosis by the REI Committee of FICO. REI is Reproductive Medicine, Endocrinology and Infertility Committee of FICO. And this is one of the most opening uh, committees which is looking after a lot of infertility and other uh, issues uh, related to endocrinology. And uh, this is the first masterclass which we are doing under the leadership of the REI Chair, Yvonne days who's from Bogota, Colombia and uh, we're going to have a series of six lectures in this master class and these are going to be delivered by none other than the most popular and people who have actually researched on endometriosis on and dealing with the various aspects of endometriosis which we normally you know have difficulty or challenges in understanding and we're going to start our first very important inaugural lecture by none other than Linda Judis, who is a very renowned person from UCSF. And she actually has worked a lot on endometriosis and on environmental factors as such. And uh, you can see on the screen the six lectures which we are going to have, which are going to be delivered by very, very eminent personalities of the world. Uh, we're starting with Linda as the first lecture. Then we have Mary Louise Hull from Australia, who is going to deliver our second talk. And the third talk is going to be delivered by uh, David Adamson. And the fourth talk is going to be delivered by um, Edgar Mocano. And the fifth talk is going to be delivered by myself. And the sixth and the final talk is going to be delivered by Rui Ferriani. Uh, from Brazil. Now, all of these talks are going to be, they're scheduled in the first week of every month in the coming months. And that is something which uh, we, and we're going to, at the end of the 
six talks, we're going to have a certification and a small MCQ test on what you have really learned and a certification will come to you. Now, it gives me my, uh, really an absolutely privilege today to introduce our chair for the REI Committee of FIGO, Yvonne Days. Uh, she is a very, very dear friend. And uh, Yvonne has been, you know, the on the seat uh, for the last three years. And she is a professor at the University of Military New Granada and Foundation University at Bogota, Colombia. And she has done some amazing uh, contributions to the REI yeah. committee. Uh, I would really invite Yvonne right now to tell us more about REI uh, committee's contributions and the forthcoming programs. Thank you, Daideep. Yvonne. Thank you, Daideep. And thank you very much for being here with us. Uh, good evening, all. Uh, we come to this master class of endometriosis. For our committee, it's very, very important uh, the activity education in this way because endometriosis is not only a problem on infertility, it's a problem of your pelvic pain and the other problem in the health of the, the woman of the world. And uh, we feel it is very, very important for the all assistant to know the new uh, update on endometriosis, about the diagnosis, about the treatment, about the possibility, many, many possibilities of treatment in this patient, in infertility and the pelvic pain too. And our, our speaker is, our, is from our committee, uh, Dr. Uh, Edgar Mocano from Ireland, is very, very a professor uh, with high quality. Uh, Laurie Henry from Belgium, Rui Ferriani for Brazil, and everyone, and Dr. David Adamson is very, very a professor, uh, important in, from USA in France and San Francisco. And Linda Guidas is a woman uh, important in endometriosis, uh, who is uh, our first speaker in our first model. Um, welcome to this important masterclass. And I let to Yaidi Malotra for to introduce our first speaker, Linda Guidas. Thank you. Thank you, Yvonne. And uh, it's my privilege now to introduce our two chairs for this particular session. Uh, none other than very renowned, again, personalities from India. We have uh, Dr. Pratap Kumar. Uh, Dr. Pratap Kumar is, has, is the professor and the head of the Department for Reproductive Medicine at the KMC Medical College, uh, Manipal. He has also been the past vice president of FOXI. He has more than 300 publications to his credit and more than 10 books to his credit. He holds various key positions in many educational institutes of the country. A very, very popular and a renowned teacher who's really, you know, sought after by all the students of our country. And our second uh, chairperson is Dr. Naren Malotra, who is the past president of Foxy, ISAR, ISPAT, and Indian Federation of Ultrasound in Medicine and Biology. He's the director of Rainbow Hospital Agra and has very keen interest in ultrasound, endoscopy, and aesthetic gynecology. Uh, Dr. Malotra has also edited more than 37 books and has numerous papers and publications to his uh, credit. And he is also the recipient of the honorary FRCOG and the fellowship of the International Federation of Perinatology. And uh, both of you are going to chair. And thank you so much for being there, Pratap and Naren. And uh, this brings me now today to the star of our session. Uh, none other than Linda Judis. I'm sure all of you know Linda. Uh, Linda is a very distinguished professor in the Department of Obstetrics, Gynecology, and Reproductive Sciences at the University of California, San Francisco. She is a biochemist. She is a reproductive endocrinologist and has specialized. Uh, Dr. Jaydeep, I think you have biomistically uh, muted yourself. Please unmute yourself, Doctor. Jaydeep, you are muted. 
okay sorry so this brings me to uh, introduce our star speaker for today none other than linda judies linda judies is a distinguished professor in the department of obstetrics gynecology reprodu and reproductive sciences in the university of california san francisco she is a biochemist she is a reproductive endocrinologist specializing clinically in endometriosis adenomyosis premature ovarian insufficiency pregnancy loss pelvic pain ovulatory disorders and infertility her tremendous research work focuses on human endometrial function and regeneration genetics and epigenetics of endometriosis placental uterine interactions adenomyosis and environmental impact and climate change on reproductive health and human development she has mentored more than 250 students fellows and faculty has authored more than 300 peer reviewed publications and is a co editor of seven textbooks on women's health endocrinology reproductive environmental health and endometrium and endometriosis linda has also been the past president of asrm sgi srei and the world endometriosis society She is the current president of IFFS and the chair of the FICO committee on climate change and toxic environmental exposures. And that is where I actually have known her for such a long time. But what I really know of her is for her tremendous work in the environmental exposures and endocrine disruptors, which uh, and especially you know her emphasis on their impact on endometriosis, and that is what. Uh, brought us to bring her to you know deliver this very prestigious uh, lecture linda is also the elected member of us national academy of medicine and us national academy of inventors uh, it is linda it's a very very proud privilege for all of us to have you for this first inaugural lecture of our master class of rei committee of fico thank you so much for accepting it for at a very very short notice and we are looking forward to your deliberations The stage is all yours, Linda.
Thank you. I would like to uh, thank the organizers for inviting me uh, to this uh, session on <clears throat> endometriosis. And today I will be talking about endometriosis and environmental risk. I do not have any disclosures. And today we are going to briefly review the pathogenesis, pathophysiology and treatment of endometriosis. And the bulk of the masterclass today will be on understanding the evidence behind endocrine disrupting chemicals or EDCs and endometriosis risk and outcomes. And then we will conclude with some take home practical strategies to mitigate risks of EDC exposures. So what is endometriosis? It's a chronic estrogen dependent progesterone resistant inflammatory pain syndrome wherein endometrial-like tissue invades extrauterine structures, causing inflammation, scarring, pelvic pain, and infertility. It affects 6 to 10% of premenopausal women and teens globally, and 35 to 50% of women with pelvic pain and infertility. It is associated with poor pregnancy outcomes, preterm birth, postpartum hemorrhage, preeclampsia, and also other chronic disorders, include, including thyroid dysfunction, autoimmune disorders, cardiovascular disease, and ovarian and breast cancers. The time to diagnosis is quite protracted because diagnosis is surgical mostly, and the quality of life impact and economic burden are huge and are similar to other chronic diseases. And over a decade ago in the US, the estimate was $69 billion. So how does endometriosis come about? Well, we think at least the most uh, popular theory is retrograde menstruation and transplantation. So that at the time of menses, some of the uh, desquamated tissue goes through the fallopian tubes and then attaches to the pelvic peritoneum, invades into it, establishes a blood supply, elicits an inflammatory response, um, and also may involve some stem cells uh, and progenitors from the endometrial lining. Another theory is that salomic metaplasia may, may be occurring, and that is where the mesothelium of the peritoneum um, transforms into endometrial epithelium. There's also a genetic predisposition, as we'll see shortly, and immune dysfunction because the tissue that's in a place where it should not be, plus it's modified from its normal anatomy and cellular composition and function, um, alerts the immune system to try to clear it, but there is a suboptimal immune response. And we know that all women have some degree of retrograde menstruation, but not all have endometriosis. So the big enigma is why is that? And today we're going to talk about environmental triggers in utero and also in adulthood. So just to give um, some further insights into the path pathophysiology uh, about this inflammatory condition, um, we know that the lining of the uterus and the lesions um, have a pro-inflammatory milieu. There are elevated cytokines, um, so inflammatory stress, increased macrophage recruitment to the lesions and to the endometrium, and altered nuclear receptor and co-activators, including elevated ER beta, which is not the estrogen receptor that's usually mediating endometrial physiology, but rather ER alpha does, and ER alpha is decreased. Uh, progesterone receptor is decreased, and we know that there are methylation defects. So abnormal methylation of the promoters for HOXA10 uh, and also PR, so hypermethylated, causing those genes to be downregulated and not being able to function too well in the tissues, in the uterus and in the lesions, and also hypomethylation of ER beta and aromatase. Um, which is the enzyme that makes estradiol and their upregulation. So central to endometriosis pathophysiology is that it is driven by estrogen. 
it's enhanced, it has enhanced estrogen and disrupted progesterone signaling and inflammation is part of its pathophysiology. And these two processes are interrelated and largely contribute to the pain and infertility in affected women. And we've just talked about the epigenetic mechanisms. Now, interestingly, Sertorbulin and group several years ago showed that some of the lesions make their own estrogen. And so you don't need the ovaries to drive this disease necessarily. And there are reports of women in the postmenopause who have active endometriosis uh, demonstrated by Bulin and colleagues uh, to be autonomously making estrogen and stimulating the disease itself. So just very briefly about treatment, uh, there are surgical options um, laparoscopically or open surgery, but mostly laparoscopically. But most, about 50% of women need repeat surgery in two to five years because of return of symptoms. And there's medical management um, that sometimes is very helpful, but most fail or are abandoned in one to two years. And these include um, anti-inflammatories, analgesics, minimizing menstruation and frequency. So including these medicines here, <clears throat> minimizing estrogen production by the ovaries, such as with contraceptive steroids or GnRH analogs, inhibiting synthesis of estradiol with aromatase inhibitors, and then counteracting more recently estrogen actions by SERMs, um, and also anti-TNF-alpha antibodies, angiogenic inhibitors, antioxidants, and other anti-inflammatories that have been uh, used in clinical trials but are not widely available currently. So how does one, what, what are the risks for this disease? Uh, Stacy Mismer several years ago demonstrated uh, through the Nurses' Health Study that women had an increased risk of endometriosis if they had early menarche, so longer exposure to estrogen, low birth weight, higher BMI, although this is controversial, in utero exposure, in this case <clears throat> to dietylstilbestrol, nulliparity, so more frequent periods compared to women who have had pregnancies, congenital uterine anomalies, a positive family history, um, Caucasians and Asians more than African Americans and Hispanics. However, this has been brought into question recently because of access to care. If you need a laparoscopy to make a diagnosis, for instance, it's um, difficult and you don't have insurance, it's difficult to get the diagnosis, let alone get treatment. Um, and decreased risks are associated with smoking, not a good reason to start. Um, lactation of more than two years, it doesn't have to be continuous, and more than three children. So again, several pregnancies. And the risks are thought to be 50% genetic and 50% environmental. And I'd like to just briefly touch on the genetics. Um, we know that <clears throat> there's an increased, six-fold increased risk if first-degree relatives have endometriosis. Twin studies show a 50% concordance rate. Genome-wide association studies by the International Endometriosis Genomics Consortium, or IEGC, that we are a part of, uh, demonstrate that there are loci or regions of the genome that are associated with endometriosis. However, there is no specific genetic variant or mutation that causes the disease. So it's not a monogenic disorder, but rather is multifactorial and polygenic. And this just shows you the GWAS studies uh, and the meta-analysis. Um, of 17,000 cases and almost 200,000 controls, initially revealed 14 independent loci, um, including sex steroids and hormone pathways. And you can see WINTs are involved, the estrogen receptor is involved, FSH beta, angiogenesis with KDR and others. And we have now expanded this study um, and we have found 44 genome-wide uh, loci uh, and the paper is in pre, uh, preparation, but these data are in bioarchives of 2019. So 
the question now is, what about the environment? Might endometriosis be an environmentally driven disorder? Today, we're going to talk about endocrine disrupting chemicals, some epidemiologic studies. That's how we know about humans and associations with endocrine disruptors. Um, experimental studies and in animals and also in vitro mechanisms that are derived mainly from animal studies and in vitro studies. And then of course, the big issue is when is the timing of exposure? If someone has say an in utero exposure, um, that may be different than if someone has an adult exposure. And just to remind everyone about um, the exposures uh, during development. The mother is F0, the fetus is the F1 generation, the gametes of the fetus are F2 that then give rise to the next generation. Um, and um, the unexposed group is F3, so the offspring of the gametes. The gametes may have been exposed, but not the offspring of the gametes. And then one can get exposure directly perinatally, in adolescence, or in adulthood. And the same type of paradigm exists in animal models. So what are some examples of um, environmental reproductive toxicants? Let's look at endocrine disrupting chemicals, or EDCs. These are chemicals or mixtures that interfere with any aspect of hormone action at any time of development and or during the life course. They can be estrogen-like, they can be androgen-like, they can inhibit estrogens uh, and other mechanisms as you'll see shortly. And environmental contaminants include the long-lasting ones like PCBs and dioxin, TCDD, or the short, shorter acting ones like plasticizers and phthalates uh, which are in children's toys and in cosmetics or bisphenol A, very uh, widely abundant in lining of cans and plastic bottles and paper uh, digital receipts. And then of course there are pesticides and preservatives and sanitizers and elements of air pollution that can disrupt the endocrine system as well as heavy metals. And exposures occur by ingestion, inhalation, transdermally and transplacentally. And Stace, uh, Tracy Woodruff and her colleagues published a few years ago, a study of a sampling of, of the US population that demonstrated that they all had measurable contents of contaminants in their bodies and mixtures of chemicals are the rule. Now the mechanisms underlying endocrine disrupting effects include, for instance, binding to the estrogen receptor. Over here, you see that bisphenol A looks very much like the estrogen diethylstilbestrol. Um, and these act through classically the estrogen receptor, either alpha or beta, activating genomic pathways and altering gene and protein expression and cell function. But there are other pathways through ER, and these are non-genomic pathways through kinase signaling cascades. And then some EDCs like dioxin bind to the aryl hydrocarbon receptor, uh, associate with the uh, translocator, bind to the dioxin response elements causing the same effect. But there are also thyroid receptor interference, androgen receptor blockers and others as shown here. But there's also another pathway and series of pathways now that have increasingly been studied and identified as um, actions of steroid hormones. So estradiol, for instance, will act via epigenetic mechanisms by altering the chromatin, opening or closing the DNA, uh, making um, promoters more available, and DNA methylation um, can usually silence genes or hypomethylation can increase these. And these two lead then to altered gene and protein expression and function. So let's take a look at development first 
and how EDC exposures might predispose to endometriosis. There's only one study in humans that we know of, or at least that I know of, and that is by Stacy Mismer. And this is the Nurses Health Study that demonstrated uh, in this prospective cohort study uh, of 116,700 female nurses um, had a prevalence at baseline of 5% of endometriosis um, that was confirmed by laparoscopy. So these women at some point in their lives had had um, endometriosis. And then in the questionnaires, they asked the patients about exposure to DES. And what they found was diethyl stilbestrol um, posed an 80% increased risk of endometriosis in adulthood. In addition, they found low birth weight predisposed to endometriosis and earlier menarche, as we mentioned before. So longer periods of um, estrogen here after menarche, uh, but in utero, it was exposure to DES and also low birth weight. So something during development. So just looking at why this might, what, what's the relevance here of an estrogen in terms of endometriosis from a physiologic perspective? If we look at the development of the female reproductive tract, we know that uterine morphogenesis is genetically controlled. It's conserved cross species and is mediated by patterning genes such as the Hox genes. And remember, we saw Hox A10 um, hypermethylated and shut down or decreased in the endometrium of adult women with endometriosis. Uh, the Wnt family is actively involved in um, uterine morphogenesis, as is ER alpha signaling. So it's not beyond um, the realm of possibility that estrogen-like mimetics could alter the development of the female reproductive tract, um, especially since the interaction between the mesenchyme and the epithelium are key to development and differentiation of this tract and are mediated by ER alpha. So there are a lot of data about vulnerability of the developing uterus to diethyl stilbestrol, mostly from animal studies and a few basically observations from human uh, work. So we know that DES causes changes in expression of WNT7A, important as we saw on the previous slide, as well as these Hox genes involved in tissue patterning and results in altered uterine morphogenesis. DES induced developmental programming requires ER alpha, um, which is a, a signaling that this is important to establish developmental programming. And we know that in utero exposure of mice to DES results in hypermethylation of HOXA10 promoters and overexpression of DNA methyltransferases. We also know on the human side that DES daughters, as you know, have abnormal vaginal adenosis. And this is a very interesting paper uh, from 1979 that reported that vaginal adenosis was also found in 80% of stillborns and neonates exposed in utero to DES in the first trimester. So this is a demonstration that during fetal development, DES had a profound effect on um, the newborn um, when it was exposed in utero. So let's take a look at animal studies now. So we've seen what happened in the human, that one epidemiologic study, and some data about DES in particular in animals and humans. And what about some other um, endocrine disruptors? Well, bisphenol A elicits the endometriosis phenotype in female offspring. So here, pregnant mice were exposed to a dose response from gestational day zero to seven days postpartum. And then the pups were born on embryo embryonic day 20 and the pelvic organs and liver and other um, tissues were examined. So this is now the F1 generation, as you see. 
And what they found were endometriosis-like tissue in the female reproductive tract adipose tissue. They found ER alpha positive lesions shown here and elements of endometrial hyperplasia. So exposure at a variety of <clears throat> concentrations resulted in endometriosis-like lesions in the offspring that, that were exposed in utero. Also, prenatal TCDD or dioxin exposure promotes endometriosis lesion growth in adult female mice, but not rats. So here, the mice, um, the pregnant mice were dosed with dioxin and then the offspring <clears throat> had surgically induced endometriosis because mice don't have retrograde menstruation. And they found that these offspring had, um, that dioxin increased in utero, exposure to dioxin increased the lesions of the adult animals in mice, but not rats. Also, um, very interestingly, endometrial progesterone receptor expression in adult mice is altered. And what you can see here is that with in utero dioxin exposure, there is hypermethylation of PR in the uterus of the offspring. And this leads then to decreased levels of PR at the protein level. And then very interestingly, if we look at transgenerationally, either direct <clears throat> F1 or uh, F3 indirect exposure to TCDD is associated with PR hypermethylation. So, um, Brunner Tran and colleagues have a very nice series of studies showing that about the impact of developmental TCDD exposure on pregnancy in adult offspring and demonstrated that pre and perinatal period is susceptible window during which EDCs can induce developmental programming and increase risk for female re reproductive tract disorders with associated DNA methylation and histone modifications. And they looked at fertility and gestational length. This is not um, endometriosis now, this is just the effect of TCDD on mice with either direct or indirect dioxin exposure. And what they found was that the pregnancy rates of all three generations were decreased and also the gestational length was shorter, so there was preterm birth. And remember that women who have endometriosis have not only the um, hypermethylated progesterone receptor and decreased levels in their endometrium, but also have poor, poorer pregnancy outcomes, including preterm birth. So how do we translate these lessons? Just to summarize this part, in humans, the only, D, only DES in utero exposure and endometriosis risk has been identified. The developmental origins of health and disease is supported by mullerianosis. Um, so finding mullerian um, tract uh, tissues in the, in the pelvis where they shouldn't be. The findings of endometriosis in the fetus uh, a study several years ago, and then preterm birth and low birth weight predisposing to disease. And the consequences of developmental exposure to EDCs are difficult to ascertain in the humans, in the human. However, animal studies um, of in utero and prepubertal exposures of EDCs result in adult reproductive disease and dysfunction, as we've seen and TCDD exposures result in epigenetic changes in reproductive tissues as observed in endometriosis that lead to transgenerational reproductive disorders common in women with endometriosis, including subfertility and increased risk of preterm birth. Now, what about adult exposures and endometriosis? So we've just looked at endometriosis risk within utero exposure. 
And we'll start off first with the human epidemiologic studies and then go to experimental models of animal studies and in vitro studies. Jermaine Buck Lewis several years ago published a, a nice article in Fertility and Sterility um, looking at evidence regarding EDCs and endometriosis risk and um, with the separation of risk by persistent EDCs and non-persistent. And what they found was evidence um, showing persistent uh, associations between persistent chemicals and risk so that dioxin and dioxin-like compound uh, had significant odds of endometriosis risk diagnosis. Organochlorine pesticides showed 27% higher risk and um, beta HCH 72% higher risk. They found no associations with PBDEs, equivocal associations with PCBs and also with PFAAs. With non-persistent chemicals, they found that UV filters, um, benzophenone type UV filters had a 19% increased risk. BPA, they found no reported significant association with surgically visualized or MRI diagnosed disease and phthalates had equivocal evidence. Recently, in the last couple of years, two systematic reviews and meta-analyses have been published on this subject. And the disclaimer uh, in this article is that despite statistical significance, which you'll see on the next few slides, consider with caution the estimates reported given the heterogeneity of the uh, phenotypes of endometriosis and also small estimated side, size effect, effect sizes. So here's our, here are the data from the meta-analysis. These are the forest plots um, of associations between exposures to dioxins as an adult and the diagnosis of endometriosis. This is in women. So here, the odds ratio is 1.65 and the 95% confidence interval is shown here. With regard to PCBs, you see again, several studies, nearly all of which show a, an association, a positive association. Um, so the odds ratio of 1.7 and um, the confidence intervals of 1.2 to 2.39. And with organochlorine pesticides and endometriosis. Here, you see the odds ratio of 1.97 and the confidence interval 1.25 to 3.13. A subsequent study in the same, published in the same year looked at um, risk of endometriosis after exposure to endocrine disrupting chemicals, um, looking at 30 epidemiology studies, some of which overlapped with the ones in the previous analysis. And they found relationships they were looking for relationships between four classic EDC exposures and risk of endometriosis. With BPA, sorry, they found uh, no significant associations. PCBs, positive association. Again, organochlorines, positive association, similar to the ones in the study um, shown on the previous slide. And phthalate esters um, show a positive uh, correlation. In particular, uh, diethylhexyl phthalate, um, which is the most commonly used uh, phthalate, showed a significant risk at 1.42 with the con confidence interval shown here. So they did an overall odds ratio across all exposures and found 1.41 with the confidence interval between 1.23 and 1.6. So how did we even think about exposure as an adult to endometriosis? It actually originated with this study published by Sherry Ryer in 1993, in which baboons, I'm sorry, rhesus monkeys were exposed to dioxin for four years. And the, the study was, what does dioxin do to these animals? So 10 years after 
dioxin exposure, the animals exhibited pain and uh, pain symptoms and gastrointestinal obstruction. And when they were operated on, endometriosis was found. And the incidence of disease directly correlated with the uh, dioxin exposure and the severity of the disease was dose dependent. So uh, those exposed to five parts per trillion of dioxin had moderate disease and those 71% uh, exposed to 25 parts per trillion had severe disease. And the controls in the breeding colonies um, are 33%. So you can see that dioxin had an effect on endometriosis, either development or exacerbation. Uh, and additionally, because 33% was the control. So non-human primates are hard to study and they're expensive to study. Um, and a number of animal models of endometriosis have been developed. And Kathy Sharp Tins has a nice book in 2020 recently published on animal models, um, and she describes the autologous surgical induction of endometriosis in female mice. So what is done is a uterine horn is excised, it's uh, cut into little pieces. These pieces are implanted on the mesenteric artery and sutured, um, and then over time the lesion develops and it's collected and it looks like endometriosis. You can see the epithelium here and the stromal uh, compartment also. Now these animals are good for testing uh, what some EDCs do to endometriosis in a controlled way. Um, and some data show that TCDD and other polyhalogenated hydrocarbons promote endometriosis lesion growth in adult animals. That's dose, um, it's under a dose response after disease was established and the lesions increased in all treated groups compared to vehicle controls. Uh, a short acting um, or short half-life EDC, BPA, and its congener BPAF um, was looked at and studied in this model. Uh, and the control was either vehicle or interestingly, ethanyl estradiol, a component of birth control pills. However, no progestins were added in this study. And what they found was, and they did the same type of study. They looked at the dose response after disease was established in the adult mice. And they looked at the increase in the lesions in all treated groups compared to the controls. And what you see here are that BPA and its congener promote cell proliferation of surgical endometriosis lesions in this mouse model as did ethanyl estradiol. Here's ethanyl estradiol, BPA here, and BPAF here. And this is KI67, and you can see uh, that this is a marker of proliferation um, in, the, in the treated groups as opposed to the vehicle controls. Now, Another way to look at endometriosis is to get human tissue from, that is human endometrium, mince it, culture it for a day with estradiol, and then put it into either overectomized mice um, or uh, new mice or uh, nod skid mice. And the disease gets established in about 24 hours. And you can see this is Normal, normal in quotes, human endometriosis um, and the histology here and the experimental human endometriosis in the mouse um, with the lesion here. Now, phthalates um, have an effect on surgical endometriosis in the mouth, in, in mice. So this was a study on five week old nod skid female mice who were ovariectomized and then replaced with estrogen and transplanted human endometrial tissue fragments were uh, performed. And then the mice were treated with um, phthalate, DHEP, DEHP, uh, either vehicle or two different doses per day for two weeks. And what they found again was lesions established and even more lesions uh, at the higher doses 
and upregulation of many of the biomarkers, if you will, of endometriosis, uh, including MMP2, MMP9, again, the proliferative marker, and this is the, the highest dose, uh, KI67 and PAX4 uh, and decreased uh, cleaved caspase. Now, dioxin uh, prevents, interestingly, progesterone-mediated suppression of experimental human endometriosis. So in this model where human fragments were put in and the animals were treated with estradiol, if they were also treated concomitantly with progesterone, the lesions did not form. However, if they were treated with estradiol and progesterone and dioxin, the lesions formed, and not only did they form, but there were more of them that formed than with estradiol alone. So basically TCDD prevented the progesterone mediated suppression of the experimental human disease in the nude mouse. Now also um, we see that TCDD blocks progesterone action and regulates MMPs much as it does in the endometrium of women with endometriosis. So looking here again, these, this is now an in vitro study of human endometrium minced, put into culture with estradiol, estradiol and progesterone, or estradiol, progesterone, and TCDD. And what you see is that TCDD blocks the progesterone action on TGF beta 2. It also um, does not, it blocks the action of progesterone and progesterone's inhibition of MMP3 and MMP9. And then, so to summarize um, what e how EDCs can promote endome the endometriosis phenotype in adult female animal models, we have seen that persistent EDCs um, in adult female rhesus monkeys um, have endometriosis, peritoneal disease with dose-dependent severity, treatment of control human endometrial tissue with TCDD promotes an endometriosis-like phenotype, loss of PGR and TGF beta as just shown on the previous slide, and promotes establishment of experimental endometriosis in adult animals. And then, then finally, TCDD and other polyhalogenated hydrocarbons promote endometriosis in mouse but not rat models. And for the non-persistent EDCs, BPA and BPAF promote endometriosis in the mouse model as does the phthalate uh, DEHP. So in summary, humans, uh, but there is biologic plausibility for endocrine disrupting chemicals and endometriosis pathogenesis and pathophysiology. The single prenatal epidemiologic study that we saw connecting in utero EDC with later development of endometriosis um, supports this. And there are epidemiologic data that support specific EDCs or their metabolites promoting endometriosis in adult women, or at least being associated with having that diagnosis. In animals, there is strong experimental evidence of prenatal and adult exposures promoting endometriosis in animal models, mechanisms of progesterone resistance and epigenetic modifications of promoters of key genes are supported by these experimental data. And in animals, but not shown in humans, transgenerational female reproductive tract dysfunction associated with F0, F1, F2, and exposures, and in the unexposed F3 generation. So what can we do? Um, we can advocate for policy change, we can educate, we can network, and we can do some things one by one and sharing this information with our patients as well. So some practical um, approaches to minimize risk are to eat fresh food and vegetables and minimize canned foods with plastic liners wash fruits, vegetables, and hands to minimize exposures to pesticides, trim fat from meat and skin from fish to minimize exposures to fat-soluble chemicals, 
store food in glass or stainless steel containers, avoid plastic containers, three, six, and seven, use BPA-free bottles and toys, avoid heating or microwaving food in plastic containers or bottles because chemicals will be leached from the plastic containers at high temperatures, and avoid nonstick pans. And then around the home, remove shoes before entering, clean floors with a wet mop or cloth because dust contains a lot of endocrine disrupting chemicals, use alternative household cleaning products, no home pesticides, uh, you can use insect baits but not sprays, avoid toxic flame retardants. And for personal habits and products, no smoking even secondhand, phthalate free makeup and other personal care products, and fragrances using fragrance free rather than unscented. Avoid hand sanitizers, digital paper release uh, receipt handling, and avoiding lead that is in some lipsticks and some uh, ethnic products as well. So I want to thank you all for your attention and I hope that we can work together to protect our reproductive health now and for future generations and especially for women with endometriosis. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Linda, for a very eye-opening session. I'm sure, you know, today we are going to understand a lot into the pathogenesis of uh, endometriosis and many ways of preventing it. In fact, when you were talking about it, I was just thinking that there will, especially the last slides, there's so many things which we or my grandparents would insist on doing, like taking off your shoes, washing, baking soda, and there's so many things. And I think we need to just go back, you know, and do all those practices uh, to keep this enigmatic disease at bay. I'm going to invite um, Yvonne for her comments and the, then the chairpersons. Deep. Uh, Linda, thank you. Excellent to deliberation and this very, very spectacular lecture. And, and this is, is absolute, absolutely now uh, the form in the endometriosis in the woman. I, I would like to, to see too about the anticonceptive with ethyl estradiol in the, in the woman, very, very, uh, for example, in adolescent, in teens. Uh, <coughs> very important uh, we can to see for example the endometriosis uh, in, in in teen adolescents when they uh, take the uh, anticonceptive ethyl estradiol and i think is a in a way for the augmentation in endometriosis uh, with the lecture is very interesting in that it's an excellent excellent deliberation thank you linda and i try to 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 introduce for the question and the comments with Dr. Narinda Marotra uh, Pratap Kumar uh, about your conference, Linda. Yeah. Thank you very much for the excellent uh, presentation. And uh, we have a lot of questions for you, Professor Linda. And I would start by saying that uh, you did mention about increased estrogen causing endometriosis. So do you think this xenoestrogen, you're talking about all these pollutions? I think they are just basically scientifically called like xenoestrogens. So do you think that does it uh, affect the root of these kind of things like the food, water, or inhalation? Is there any evidence of increased risk with a particular type of endocrine disruptor or the root of exposure? So first, I want to thank you for the opportunity to have participated in this inaugural master class and inaugural lecture. Um, the, the question about endocrine disruptors, um, we know that everyone is exposed to uh, mixtures of chemicals, and it's very hard to pinpoint one particular chemical as a cause. That said, the precautionary principle of trying to mitigate or decrease or avoid exposures as much as possible um, is, is the path forward. 
And, you know, by just say mopping in the house and JD, I agree with you what our grandmothers did um, in terms of cleaning the home um, with ammonia and water and um, sweeping and mopping um, was good hygiene. And the we now know that something like dust is a mixture of chemicals. So keeping a clean home, keeping a clean floor uh, is important. And it's especially important with uh, toddlers, little ones who are crawling on the rug or on the, on the floor um, because they touch everything and they have different physiology than we do. And they're still developing. Um, so exposure to endocrine disruptors as much as you can as a, as a class of uh, contaminants uh, is going to be important for development as well as adult health. Yeah, Narin will ask you the next question. Uh, great, great talk, uh, Dr. Linda. Um, there are questions uh, which are there, but let me ask you from my side. Do we see a world uh, without plastic in your future? Everything is... Uh, the <laughs> <laughs> Um, we hope there is a world with decreased plastics, and I think it's important to um, realize the benefit of plastics and pesticides. I mean, there are reasons why these um, approaches have been adopted. The most important, I think, is for good practices for uh, manufacturing, for disposal, and for recycling of plastics and other um, agents. Um, you know, if we look at the Pacific Ocean, there is an area about the size of the state of Texas, which is a very large state in the U.S., um, of floating plastic debris that has basically um, aggregated together. And if we stop polluting our beaches and throwing plastic off of ships, um, I think we will, and, and many other approaches, I think we will be able to decrease um, this type of exposure. But I think plastics are here to stay, and they are very valuable in many settings. Um, but it's the judicious use of plastics and reuse or recycling. And also, uh, importantly, uh, not to be heating uh, food, for instance, in plastic containers and microwave ovens, because it's been shown um, in a number of studies that these plastics leach out uh, from the plastic and leach into the food that we eat. Yeah. A very nice, so the uh, message, yeah. message is loud and clear, ladies and gentlemen, who are listening to this. Uh, you've got to change. And if we start changing now, maybe 30, 40 years down the line, grandchildren and their children would see a better world. Or we will have to build colonies on the moon and Mars and uh, migrate away from this earth, mm -hmm. which we human beings are ourselves spoiling every day in, day, day out. So to probably, continue, uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, continue what Narendra asked. Uh, can I ask you the supplement question on this uh, discussion? Uh, you did say about talates, uh, which are equivocal in your talk. So, do you think these talates in the plastics are the major problem, and the heavy metals and the pesticides with similar properties, especially in countries like a developing country like India? Do you think they can cause similar? pathological conditions? I do, um, mainly because of the commonality of um, mechanisms that promote um, the um, uh, epigenetic changes that affect not only tissue function uh, in the adult, uh, but also a developing um, fetus and transgenerationally. Now we yeah. haven't seen, uh, or at least I'm not aware of transgenerational reports in humans, 
Um, but again, these are very difficult studies to do. But with regard to the phthalates, um, they are a group of, and, and they have different, many of them are anti-androgens, um, and their effects on the developing male fetus um, have been well summarized by Shana Swan. Um, and the whole issue of uh, fertility and sperm counts and what direction those are taking, um, phthalates are among um, some of the agents that are thought to be contributing to those observations. Yeah, thank you. So I have another question to heavy for you. Model. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, uh, I always uh, feel yeah. that we should look after prepubertal girls, adolescent girls, so because they have a higher risk. There are several reports which show early onset of puberty and obesity in girls. Mm -hmm. Whether high exposure at this age of these kind of uh, plasticides, as what you are talking about, is it connected to premature uh, sort of early puberty and also obesity? Great question. Um, there are a couple of studies from Eastern Europe or about um, premature menarche in, um, and premature breast development in little girls who were um, in a, an environment of high pesticides and when adopted uh, and removed from this environment, the, um, the breast development actually receded. So the good news is that some of these things are reversible, um, but um, the disturbing news is that these agents can promote uh, early puberty and early narc, and not only in girls, but also in boys. Um, That's right. The, Sorry, the, the issue, uh, and the other question was, was what? Obesity. Obesity, yes. Um, there are numerous studies about so-called obesogens. Um, and again, it's the endocrine disruptors that are thought to have an effect during development on the developing pancreas, uh, for instance, um, giving rise to dysfunction later in life. Um, and it is really quite, I think, amazing that uh, the obesity rates are becoming a, an epidemic uh, globally. Um, yeah. Do I think all of it is due to chemicals? Probably not. Um, not sure. But I think there is a component sure. that does contribute to that. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Narin, I have another question. Thank you so much. So, Narin, so you, we... So, we need to get the Chinese in. So there is a Chinese meta-analysis conducted by a Chinese group, which suggests a strong association of metabolites of phylates in the Chinese population. So do we have to be very cautious about coming to a conclusion that these things, as there is a possibility in women getting exposed to multiple endocrine disorder, disruptors, some of which may be persistent through in the environment in low level, but yet are not uh, in the biological assessment. So do you think uh, there is a population which will, or a genetic factor which will prevent some women uh, going through to endometriosis by endocrine disruptors, or it's going to be a multiple etiological factor? Hmm. Especially That's with the Chinese population. Yeah. 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 Ah. So, um, there are low levels of these chemicals that um, can elicit changes, and they have very interesting properties of non-monotonic responses. Um, so usually you see the higher the dose, the, the greater the effect, but with endocrine disruptors, and this has been extensively studied, um, even low doses can promote uh, very dramatic effects. <clears throat> I think that in, in all populations, we need to be very careful. Um, there, there are two things. One is having adequate biomonitoring in a, in a country is very important. And not all countries have um, systematic biomonitoring. 
um, because the biomonitoring data then give you information about what the population is exposed to. Uh, much of that has to do with um, climate and particulate matter in the air. However, there are also ways to do biomonitoring dust, for instance, in households. Um, whether the endometriosis, we don't know. Um, and hot spots for endometriosis have not been identified from an epidemiologic perspective. And that, I think, would be an important assessment to try to understand the exposure history, say, of a given population, wherever it is, and the incidence or prevalence of endometriosis. I'm hoping someday we will have those data. Yeah, so great. It is biomonitoring, which is so important now, which may tell you about the risk. And that is what we've got to come down to and monitor our environment, monitor our bodies, and monitor what are the endocrine disruptors which are disrupting our... Uh, we, we all have the same genes, but some of the bad ones get uh, activated by the, the endocrine disruptors. Uh, that's that's what something happens. So to continue... So I'd like to just address that particular issue with regard to genetic predisposition, um, because not everyone who is exposed to the same agent necessarily is affected. And the gene environment interaction is something that is still in its um, infancy, that do not really understand genetic risk associated with certain disorders. Um, and when I mentioned 50% genetic risk and 50% environmental risk for endometriosis, what I did not mention was that there's likely interaction between these two um, that also contributes to risk. So, you know, if we think of pharmacogenomics, where there are certain populations that have genes that will respond to certain medications, um, it's likely that there will be certain genes in populations that will respond to endocrine disruptors, uh, but not in other populations or individuals. Fantastic, okay. fantastic clarification yeah. of the endometrial genetic uh, uh, linkup. Yes, Dr. Jedi. Yeah. Yeah, Linda, can I ask you, like, is there any way where we can, you know, sort of detoxify ourselves with all these endocrine disruptors who are, which are bombarding us from all over? That's a great question. Um, I think, you know, education is important. Education of healthcare professionals, education of the public, education of ministers of health. Um, the ability to minimize exposure is, is very important. Um, but we would hope we would get to the point where we don't have to do detoxification, um, whatever that may involve. However, um, decreasing exposures does have results. Um, there are several studies, um, one here in California among Latina um, adolescents. Um, there was a study done showed by, uh, with decreasing um, particular uh, personal care products that uh, phthalates and BPA levels were decreased in the blood. Um, the whole example of lead in gasoline and lead in paint, uh, when those were taken out in the, at least in the US in the 1960s and 50s, um, the lead level in the population at large decreased dramatically. Um, so there are ways to, when in decreasing exposures, you can actually decrease your body burden. Um, but detoxification, I think, is perhaps maybe the next step if that is not successful. Yeah, that's interesting. Can I ask you a question, uh, Professor Linda, about, you know, uh, we saw a lot of studies go in your talk, but uh, what I find is, most of these endocrine disruptors may undergo biotransformation, which may pose challenges in executing these type of studies. So are there any sensitive methods to detect the level of the endocrine disruptors? 
Yes, there are. Um, there is mass spectrometry now that can determine very, very low levels. Um, my colleague, Tracy Woodruff, uh, recently published a paper on maternal child uh, pairs and the blood levels of, I think, close to 5,000 different chemicals using a high throughput technology and uh, mass spectrometry. So, and some of that is not targeted. So you find things that you weren't necessarily looking for um, and can be done in a rapid way. Um, and those types of techniques that are um, non-targeted essentially give you not only the information about when the data are analyzed, uh, not only information about what you're looking for, but also any potential metabolites involved. So, yeah, let's, so let's come to the last last comment or question from you. Uh, human beings adapt themselves to so Darwin's theory. Whatever awareness we create for environment, I'm, I, it's not going to go, go out very soon. So do you think the human race will adapt to all these environmental disruptors and will somehow become immune to all the dust and pollution? We have a little bit, but do you think that uh, we, will, we will adapt to all this? Because it's I don't think it's we're going to clear off in the near future. So I think basically you're asking whether we can mutate like the COVID virus or not. Yeah, yeah whether, whether we're going to mutate, mutate like the COVID and you know, protect ourselves. <laughs> I would hope we don't have to adapt so much. I suspect we've already adapted to some extent. Um, and I think that we need to be careful because we have only one earth and um, the health of our children is so important. They are the next generation. I have great hopes that the current generation of young people who are very tuned into issues of climate change, will also expand their uh, horizons and look at the effects and potential effects of endocrine disruptors, um, which are perhaps unseen because you don't see the chemicals, whereas you see the heat and the fires and the wind and the rising sea levels associated with climate change. So EDCs are a bit, um, sort of under the radar in terms of awareness. Um, and I think it's our responsibility to spread the word continuously, right. um, but also to educate our children in schools. And that means educating teachers and principals and um, local governments about the importance of this. Uh, can I just ask you one thing? Sorry, can I just ask you this one question, question and then we wind up? Yeah, and then yeah. you won't get their opinion. I just need to get this question answered by you. There are not many studies in the literature to show the molecular changes, gene expression pattern, or the exact mechanism behind this association. Deducing the pathway may give us some clue on coming up with mitigating strategies. What is your thought? The mechanisms, again, derive from animal models. And what I presented today was a very small portion of a voluminous amount of literature. Um, the Endocrine Society and Endocrine Reviews in 2009 and in 2015 has um, summaries of, of these, and there are more that have evolved over the years. Um, so the the mechanisms are beginning to be better understood i think one of the key issues and if this is the link for endometriosis is how do the, how does this class of chemicals affect the immune system um, and set up an immune response in term which it does in terms of reactive oxygen species and so forth so I'm hoping, and I, I don't know if I answered your question completely, um, but we, we need to, again, I think, 
uh, adopt the precautionary principle. We may not know everything, and in humans, it's it would be unethical, of course, to do randomized control trials um, of chemicals and mixtures to look at outcomes. Um, so we have to depend on animal data for mechanisms. And the other thing is that in evaluating human data, there is a special approach called the navigation guide that includes uh, systematic reviews of all the human epidemiologic data plus all of the animal data in order to grade um, harm or no harm or m minor harm of a specific chemical. So we're still moving forward uh, and developing methodologies. Um, but again, I think that prevention is at this point um, the way to go. So thank, thank you very, very much. much. Uh, last so I just have one, one last, last comment before uh, the moderator and Yvonne takes over. I think the future would be to do a biomonitoring uh, for the future, which may help us in identifying the high risk group. Do you agree with that? I do. I think biomonitoring of environments is important. I think biomonitoring for body burden levels of chemicals may be more challenging, not necessarily from a technologic perspective, but what do you do with that information if you know you have high BPA levels, for instance? Yeah. That's the time to look at your drinking water source and other potential sources for high levels. Thank you. Yeah. So, Linda, Professor one last uh, distinct your thoughts. Since you are heading the Climate Change and Toxic Environmental Exposures Committee of FIGO, what are your thoughts on how countries, societies can come forward and you know do take some uh, interventions which will have a lasting impact? So I think. Um, Ditas Desina and the Philippine experience is something we can all learn from. Um, a major effort through the Philippine OBGYN Society of developing a primer on uh, environmental exposures and reproductive health uh, for healthcare professionals, for patients, and also for um, ministers of health. And then, once one is able to launch a rather massive educational campaign, um, then begin to um, put into action certain mitigation strategies. Um, but it doesn't, it's not on the shoulders of one person. I think it's on the shoulders of many people to work together to be able to do that. Thank you. Yeah, I, have yes, I have a last comment for you. What do you think about uh, to promote uh, the contraception without uh, ethyl estradiol or estrogen for the uh, gene people, for the gene doll, uh, girls, adolescent girls, for to avoid in the future endometriosis? Because the estrogen in the first time of the life is most possible to develop endometriosis. What do you think about that? So that's a, a good question and one that is um, has been discussed in terms of or is in discussion um, about the role of estrogens in uh, contraceptive steroids or combined oral contraceptives for the treatment of dysmenorrhea and also uh, chronic pelvic pain and endometriosis, especially in the adolescent population, as you've mentioned. Um, it's a little controversial right now. Uh, it's an unknown, but the I think there are there is a movement to go towards progestin only contraception or um, contraceptive preparations um, for the treatment of endometriosis without the estrogen. But that said, that there's still um, we don't really have that information because the progestin does oppose the action of estrogen. And so the um, the experiment that I showed, and I, and I mentioned specifically that they did not have a progestin in that experimental paradigm. Um, so we don't know 
how that might be that might affect it in the um, uh, animal models that were used. The on the on the good side, I think, are the data from uh, Kaylin Brunner Tran showing that estrogen can promote endometriosis in the mouse model, and that progesterone can mitigate that. So that would say that at least it, with those two steroids, um, there is a, a, a good inhibition. It's not quite applicable though to the human situation because there is a degree of abnormal progesterone signaling and we don't quite know uh, exactly how that might counter the effects of either estradiol or um, ethanyl estradiol. So something to think about, uh, and I think we should keep that discussion going on. Okay, thank you. So to, to conclude, uh, Jerry will propose the word of thanks. Before that, 7th June is the World Safe Food Day. And let us all pledge to eat safe, to prevent ourselves from EDCs, and to be healthier, healthier, inner, uh, by soul and by body. Dr. Jedi, for the vote of thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Linda, for your excellent deliberations. Absolutely indebted and, you know, uh, grateful to you uh, for, you know, accepting this at a very, very short notice. And that was a amazing, amazing lecture with a lot of insights into what we need to do. Uh, thanks, Yvonne, for, you know, uh, agreeing to do this masterclass and uh, I'm sure it, there's a lot in store for us. And thank you, Pratap and Narain, for being the great chairpersons and amazing questions, which I'm sure, again, the audience are definitely going to be benefited with these celebrations. And I am looking forward to seeing all of you in the first week of July, where we are going to have another speaker from Australia, Mary Louise Hull who is going to deliberate on challenges in understanding the pathophysiology of endometriosis. And now over to you, Shubhaji, for the formal vote of thanks. Thank you, Dr. Jaydeep. And uh, on behalf of uh, Harmonica Acumentis, I would really like to thank FIGO and REI committee for bringing six online modules of a continuing medical education program masterclass on endometriosis. A word or two about our company. Acumes is India's largest manufacturing setup and 12% of all the manufacturing tablets, capsules, injections, which are sold in India come from our stable. Acumentis is the formulation marketing setup under Acumes and we currently span the TA of gynecology, pediatrics, ortho, dermatology, ENT, and of course, cardiology and diabetology. Quite a few brands of ours were the first of their kind, and we take great pride in successfully launching innovative formulations. We would like to thank Professor Linda for sharing her clinical experience and time taken for this program, and also thank Dr. Yvonne for being the course coordinator. Harmonica Acumentis thanks Dr. Jaydeep Malhotra for guidance and help in bringing FIGO REI certification program on endometriosis for our Indian doctors. I also take this opportunity to thank Dr. Pratap Kumar and Dr. Naren Malhotra for accepting our request and participating in this program and expressing their extensive clinical experience to our participants. Thanks to all viewers for joining this educational program of FIGO on endometriosis and requesting all to attend the multiple choice questions. Last but not the least, we would like to thank DocMode Health Technologies for being the technical support partner and more. We look forward for each one of you participating in the next module of this FIGO ROI Masterclass on Endometriosis program in July 2021. Thank you very much. Good night and Namaskar, all of you. Thank so you. Over 1,000 people have live uh, access, had live uh, views. I just got it on my this thing. More than 1,000 people have heard you live, Linda. All the best. Thank you very much. And I'm sure in the next one, there are going to be many more. So thank you so much again. And all the best. A very good night and a very good day to everyone. Good night. Thank you. Good morning. Bye -bye. Good morning. Good night. Thank you so much. <laughs>